Hey, on the other hand, she's propped up by Jack, a guy who seems to always know where to go and what to do. We have to stay on the ship as long as possible. Come on. No, come on, let's go this way. Come on, Rose. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, Rose. Come on. 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 He knows everything somehow. It's going fast. We have to move. Including the physics of what will happen when a 45,000 ton vessel sinks in the water. The ship is gonna suck us down. Take a deep breath when I say. He's selfless and flawless. Then there's examples of the obstructing, lower ranking crew members on Titanic as either assholes, jerks, dickheads, fuckwads. Come along, you. Cowards. I'm going for God. Spineless I'm pussy me. men. I'm sure they all weren't little bitches, but it helps the simplicity of the script. At least the movie showed Ismay looking somewhat remorseful in the lifeboat. He wasn't counting his money or complaining or something like that. In real life, you probably had a lot of first-class rich guys who were super nice and were really good family men, and third-class guys that were drunk assholes who beat their wives. But in James Cameron's little brain, people fit into categories according to their class. Sure, the tables and light fixtures were perfectly accurate, but the comical interpretation of the people wasn't. Now, you moron! Now, I use the term one-dimensional a lot, so let me expand on that. Rose's mother has a good scene in this movie. You almost feel sorry for her at this moment. So there's this, and then there's the scene when Cliff says, oh, Open your heart to me, Rose. Both characters have a fleeting glimpse of some depth, but it never returns and it may have all been fraudulent anyways. All throughout the movie, Rose's mother acts like a fucking horrible person, she says with complete sincerity, but university is a place to find a suitable husband. Rose has already done that. What a bitch! She orders around all the maids and acts like a clueless cunt. I'd like a cup of tea when I return. Yes, ma'am. Now she's either playing the act of being a first-class rich woman, Will the lifeboats be seated according to class? Or she really is a selfish monster, and this scene was all for show. She certainly doesn't act like a woman who's terrified of losing her good name and becoming poor. So when Rose leaves, you feel almost no sympathy towards her, thus detaching any emotional interest in anything happening. A simple trick would have been to show her looking more worried about Jack Dawson, rather than looking filled with hatred and disgust. The mother's internal conflict of having to marry off her daughter in exchange for her happiness could have made her a more interesting character. Same goes with Huxtable. He could have easily been portrayed as a kind of sad, lonely, rich guy. Maybe he spent his whole life acquiring his fortune and didn't have time for love. He could be awkward and kind of inconsiderate because he doesn't know how to treat a woman. But as Corey didn't need to be evil, and certainly wouldn't try to murder anyone, I guess if you need some action, maybe have his manservant try to kill them for some other personal reason. Maybe Cliff could try to stop him from trying to murder them and he gets shot in the process. You know, some depth. But instead, Huxtable becomes a mustache twirler. The real villain in the film should have just been the iceberg. That's the way to win over her heart, buddy. Conversely, Jack's only detriment is that he litters. Hey, are you gonna go get that? I thought you cared about the environment. What a hypocrite. Unsubscribe. Or a cynic. However, while Cameron understands real people about as much as George Lucas, the man can write a screenplay like nobody's business. Except for the dialogue part. What I was thinking was, what could have happened to this girl to make her think she had no way out? Despite what I consider an unnecessary modern day subplot, it's a tight script filled with wonderful little moments details, and setups and payoffs. Here are some now. Kate doesn't just find her rape whistle, it's set up ahead of time. The knife Fabrizio wins in the poker game he later uses to cut the ropes on the lifeboat. Lovejoy's gun is established and shown to Cliff, which comes into play later. Rose learns how to spit from Jack, and then later uses the skill against Cliff, right in his face. Now you might be thinking that these all sound like really small, pointless, and obvious things. And yes, yes they are. But the point is, a lot of scripts don't even bother with tiny setups like this. When they don't, you find yourself saying, Oh, I guess he's just got a gun now. 
Okay. Oh, she just spit in his face. Okay. It's kind of weird, but I guess it worked. She got away. Hey, look. That guy just happened to have a whistle that she could use. That's convenient. You see, brief setups avoid confusion later. The less questions people ask inside their own brains, the more they'll enjoy the film. The old car is established. Jack knowing how cool the view is at the bow of the ship is established. He may not have written the most realistic characters, but for someone who is making a $200 million budget movie, at least he understands the basics of screenwriting. Oh. There are also a lot of smaller details that show that Cameron has a good grasp on the visuals as well. These are really small things, but worth mentioning. Because I notice little things, like Captain Smith's foreboding sunken lemon in his tea. Next, if you notice when Jack proposes a toast, Rose's mother is the only one who doesn't raise her glass or drink. It's very subtle and it's in the background, but it makes sense. And then when Kate enters the afterlife or whatever it is, Captain Smith is the last person to be seen applauding, as the captain is always the last off the ship. Number 10, sink or swim. So does Titanic survive this review? Does it sink or swim? Well, the real Titanic sunk. I think in this reviewer's opinion, it's split right down the middle. No pun intended. Technically, the Titanic didn't split down the middle. It split between the third and fourth funnels. Which is not really in half, it's more closer to two-thirds. Check your facts before you say something. What? What the fuck? Unsubscribe. Who are you? Check your facts. Who are you? Check your facts. Oh, I know all the facts, you little asshole. I got them in my brain. So let's recap and break it down. James? I just heard that you have to see it. It's just so full of human drama. It has all of life in it. I liked all the special effects of how the boat was sinking and how it was made. Oh, and the romance played a big role in the movie, I think. Just look at the top box office films of all time, and then consider suicide. It's the reason why a quality film like Hugo earned nearly ten times less than a movie like Shrek 2. Directors like Cameron and Spielberg are masters at pulling at those all-important heartstrings. With some exceptions, they are the makers of the movie versions of Applebee's, Panera Bread, and TGI Fridays.